O mighty God, return to me, O merry memory, the history of the hero and his unholy ring, who wandered far from fatherland ere his ill-fated fall, where the running river Rhine carried him to distant realms. Many were the sights he saw and the minds that he studied. Much pain his spirit suffered as he sojourned in far lands, and poorly fared his frame in lands of fair elves and frost giants. He who after hard-fought battles was born to Bilskirnir becomes the Sigurd of our saga of which I now speak. Nick Williams woke up in a soft bed. It was far softer than any he had ever slept on before. It was both soft yet firm, and it was one of the most comfortable things he had ever experienced. He felt his aches and pains melt away, and he almost felt like he was sinking into his bed. It was almost like floating gently on a cloud, and for a moment he could see himself sleeping peacefully in the heavens, drifting lazily through the air far above the mortal world below. He smiled at the thought, and drifted back into a contented sleep. In his dreams, the clouds around him turned dark and lightning flashed. A storm began raging around him, and soon his bed didn't feel so comfortable. He tried to cling to something as the winds picked him up and threw him around violently. He fell down through the air, only to be carried up again by an updraft. He looked around for anything to help anchor him in place, but he was at the mercy of the storm. He felt like he was trying to fight the whirlwind. He screamed in fear and frustration, but the storm kept flinging him around like he was a toy. Then he saw it. It was massive. It glowed a bright, brilliant blue and seemed to pulse with energy. Even looking at it hurt, and he shielded his eyes to look away from the colossal structure in front of him. It gave off a low hum that Nick could hear over the storm that almost sounded like singing. He tried covering his ears, but the song burrowed its way into his mind. He screamed as it assaulted all five of his senses. It felt like he was on fire, and the fire burned like a blazing inferno through his eyes, his ears, his tongue, and his nostrils. His skin tingled with a burning electric feeling, and it was all he could do to keep from going insane. It was like being in the presence of the spirit of life itself. He screamed as it burned away everything dead inside of him. He could feel more and more of himself burning away, and he began to fear that there would be nothing left. Time lost all meaning to him. He could have been staring at it for eons or seconds, and he wouldn't have known. Finally, the terrible and glorious thing withdrew from him, and slowly he felt his sanity return. The vision of the thing was still burned in his mind, but it slowly began to change in his mind's eye. The great structure began to shift and grow until he realized he was staring at a tree. The tree was fed by deep wells, and hanging from its branches were entire worlds that grew from the tree like fruit. He could see creatures living in the tree too. There was a giant eagle in its branches and a serpent gnawing at its roots, and one squirrel running back and forth between the two of them. They were magnificent creatures, but he could see the death in them, and he knew they hated the tree for what it was. The eagle and the serpent tried to destroy the tree, but it seemed to grow even in spite of the two creatures. The same strong wind that had taken him prisoner blew around the tree, shaking its mighty branches. Every now and then a branch would fall or a root would shrivel up, but the tree would grow back even stronger and more vibrant. Nick gazed in awe at the tree in his mind, but soon his amazement turned to horror. The tree, the immortal tree of life itself, began to die. It was slow at first, a branch withering here and a root rotting there, but soon the whole tree began to shrivel and cracks began forming in the tree. The serpent and the eagle began fighting even more angrily, and the tree began to fall apart even faster until Nick saw it die before his eyes. It exploded in a flash of blinding light, killing everything in its path. Whole worlds were consumed, and Nick watched as all the life in the universe was extinguished in one terrible moment. If life had been torture, then death was beyond words. He felt everything in him begin to die all at once too, until all that was left was the most twisted, vile parts of his soul. He tried to speak, but he had no voice in him. He opened his mouth to let out a silent cry of agony before he fully died. Then he felt it. It was worse than the torture. It was worse even than the death he felt. It was an overwhelming solitude. He felt himself, alone and dead, with only his own corrupted corpse to keep him company. In the solitude of the eternal darkness, he gave up all hope. Nick sat up and screamed. The death of the world tree was still in his mind like some dreaded vision. He might have slipped back into insanity if it hadn't been for a soft, comforting touch. 
He gasped in horror and turned to see a woman sitting on the bed next to him. She was incredibly tall, and Nick looked at her in surprise as she towered over him. She was pale and lethe, and she was more beautiful than any woman he had ever seen. She had soft, smooth features, with gentle lips and long blonde hair that seemed to shimmer and shine like gold. Her hair was one of the most beautiful things he had ever seen, and she wore it like a crown of glory. Despite her size, her hands were soft and delicate, and they caressed his head gently as she soothed him. Her touch calmed him, and he slowly began to forget his vision of the world tree, though not completely. Even her tender, motherly touch couldn't banish that nightmare. Slowly, as his nerves began to calm, he took in the room around him. The walls were made out of ornately carved wooden beams, polished carved stones, beautifully wrought metal panels, and masterfully woven tapestries. Everything in the room was a work of art, depicting epic battles and heroic tales. Some of the artwork came to life through complex machines, causing them to move with an amazing vivacity that enthralled him. The floor was no less intricately carved, and it fit together in a beautiful, interlocking puzzle. In the center of the room was a giant hearth. The smoke from the fire billowed gently up towards the ceiling, where it gathered together and formed into thunderclouds, causing lightning to crackle softly above his head. The roof was the least impressive part of the room, and even it was made out of interlocking shields that were made out of polished silver and edged with gold. The room was one of the most amazing things Nick had ever seen. The most surprising part of the room was the bed itself. He was surprised to see that his bed was actually a cloud. It was unlike any cloud he had ever encountered. It supported his weight and wrapped around him like a warm blanket. He turned in amazement back to the tall woman and laughed with delight. She smiled at him softly. Welcome to Bilskirna, Nicholas. I am Sif, lady of these halls. Did you rest well? she asked. He was about to answer, but the world tree flashed across his vision and he remained silent. She looked at his haunted expression and frowned. He stared bitterly at the floor. He thought about hiding the vision from her, but he knew better than to try and deceive an Aesir. I saw the death of the world tree, he said grimly. As he spoke, a dark expression marred her beautiful face, but it was gone as soon as it came. Do not let such visions trouble you here, she said with a soft smile. Rest, hero, and leave your troubles at the door of this great hall. Nick listened to Sif and sat back in his bed. Servant girls came into the room with food and drink and music. They brought new clothes and hot water to draw a bath in a nearby room. He ate oatmeal, bacon, buttered toast, and honey cakes, washing it down with milk, juice, water, and even mead. The food was amazing like nothing he had ever eaten before. He felt like he hadn't eaten in ages, and he began devouring it like a wolf. Harps and flutes played sweetly in the background, calming his nerves. He listened to the music and ate until he couldn't eat another bite. After his breakfast, he took a bath in warm water. It was hot enough to soothe his aches and pains, but not so hot that it burned to sit in the water. Once he was done with his bath, he stepped out and a couple of servant girls began massaging his shoulders and his back, giving much-needed relief to his sore muscles. Once they had finished, he finished getting dressed. The clothes were very different from his own. They were made out of soft linen, ornately woven with blues and reds and gold embroidery. His pants were a light tan, with brown and black patterns weaving their way from the cuffs to the waist. His boots were fine leather with fur trim, and his cloak was fur trimmed as well, and it seemed to have a storm cloud pattern. Nick saw his reflection in the mirror and almost couldn't believe his own eyes. He looked like a new man. He was starting to like the hospitality of the gods. Sif beckoned for her servant girls to open the doors, and she led the way through the halls. At the entrance to the halls, they met Thor. He said nothing, but nodded courteously to Nick. He was tall and strong with long red hair. He didn't exactly look handsome, but he was an imposing, commanding figure. Around his waist was an exquisite belt, and on his hands were steel gloves. They would have looked strange to Nick, but he saw the mighty hammer on his belt, and he knew better than to point out the god's strange attire. Thor left his hall, leading the way through Asgard, with Sif and her servants close behind. Nick followed near the back and looked in awe at the mighty city of the gods. He thought that since they were gods, everything would have been made out of gold, silver, and jewels. It only made sense that the gods should be surrounded by only the purest, most valuable things, and that they should have enough wealth to make even the richest man look poor. There was indeed gold, silver, and jewels, but less than he might have thought. Many of the structures were made out of carved stone or wood. Others seemed to be fashioned out of the surroundings. He saw trees that merged perfectly into houses, or bricks that seemed to be made out of clouds, and other similar things. As he walked through Asgard, though, he immediately knew that there were few places, if any, that were more beautiful. It wasn't so much that Asgard was made out of only perfect things, 
Instead, it was as if in Asgard, everything was brought to perfection. Everything from the dirt to the stars found the perfect placement and purpose in their divine home. Before long, they had traveled through the city, and they arrived at another palace. This was, in fact, made out of gold, and nothing compared to its beauty. Everything was either made out of or gilded in gold. It was gorgeous. It had high towers and massive halls, and it seemed to dominate the landscape. Nick approached the palace with awe and trepidation. It was surrounded by hard-looking men, with shields and spears and steel armor. They were dressed in wolf and bear cloaks. Some were old and grizzled with age. Others were younger than Nick, but each man looked like he was ready to deal death with one stroke, and Nick made sure to avert his gaze. He entered the hall behind Thor, and his jaw dropped. It was like nothing he had seen before. There were golden rivers that seemed to move with a life of their own or trees with golden bows that rustled in the wind. The roof was carved to look like the night sky, and it moved with the night sky. The walls depicted the mighty tales of the gods and battles against the giants, and the floors showed the tales of great heroes of the gods. The center of the room was dominated by a massive hearth, surrounded by thirteen large tables. Each table had a massive throne at its head, and each throne was occupied by a god, except one. Sif and Thor approached the throne. Thor ascended to his seat with powerful strides and sat down. He had a regal air about him, and he seemed to almost radiate a magnificent aura. Sif sat next to him, slightly lower, but close to his side. In Vingolf, the hall of the goddesses, her throne was glorious and splendid, but in Gladsheim she was contented with her plain seat next to her husband. He looked around the room to see all the gods seated in their mighty thrones. There was Loki, welcome and unwelcome, half-giant and blood-brother of Odin, ever scheming and crafting some plot. He smiled with mischief and fire danced in his eyes. Then there was Forseti, bringer of justice. There was Ullr of the cold and Valley the young, ever ready with their bows. Across from Valley was Hodr the blind, murderer and murdered, shrouded in darkness. Vithar the vengeful with his strong leather sandal, and Heimdall the nine-born guardian, ever watchful. There was Bragi the bard, keeper of the Kvasir Mead, Tyr, the one-handed warrior, and Frey, the swordless, pride of the Vanir. Next to him, across from Thor, was Njord, the mighty Vanir of the sea, keeper of the drowned. Nick stood in awe of the gods as they laughed and feasted with each other, but one god drew his eye above all the company of the Aesir. Nick looked on the All-Father, seated on his throne, with fair Frigga on his right and Baldur the beautiful on his left. Mighty Odin, half-blind and with one eye ever on the future, sat and stared at Nick. His gaze was overpowering, and Nick felt the god beckoning to him. Nick looked upon the god and heard a voice whispering in his mind, giving him counsel. Now I know I'm insane, Nick thought to himself. I'm hearing voices in my head. But the voice wasn't some senseless chatter, or the voice of a lunatic, and it wasn't the melody of madness from the world tree either. Instead, it sounded like the voice of pure rationality and wisdom. It felt almost like a cure to the madness of the tree, and he felt reassured by it. Nick listened to the voice and walked towards the god, but when he was at the foot of the god's throne, he took another step past him and bowed before his queen. He addressed her plainly. Queen Frigga, mother of the gods, he said, averting his gaze from hers. I am a wanderer, a man far from home, and I come here as your humble servant, asking for shelter until I am ready to go on my way. You were right to address me she said, and I will make sure that you are treated as a noble guest in these halls. She turned to Odin. He looked old beyond belief, old but alive, and full of power. He was imposing, and in his face were signs of discernment and understanding. Nick understood why he was king of all the gods. He lowered his head and waited on Odin's decision. Odin didn't utter a single word. Instead, he gave a slight nod. His chin barely even moved, but the whole gathering of gods erupted in a cheer of laughter. Soon the hall was alive with servants, bringing in food and drink and music, and the gods began singing along with the songs of their deeds and exploits. They turned to Bragi, who sang aloud for everyone in the hall to hear. It was the sweetest song Nick had ever heard, and he doubted he would ever hear anything half as sweet ever again. He couldn't understand the words, but the melody and the tune was so sweet that he couldn't help but be moved by it. It was familiar to him, too. It wasn't that he had heard the song before, though, or that it reminded him of some event in his life, but it felt like a song that he knew by heart. He knew every note, and he even knew where the notes he knew were different than the ones the poet gods sang. 
It wasn't that the god was wrong, though. Nick knew his own song was incorrect or incomplete, and he knew it as soon as he heard the note ring out from the god's lips. It was as if the god was singing Nick's own song, and every note described who Nick was, who he wanted to be, and what he wasn't. Nick found himself humming along to the tune, and before he knew it, he was dancing. Nick would have listened to the song for much longer. He wished it could have gone on forever. Maybe it could have gone on for eternity, too. But the gods grew tired of the music and began shouting for a game. It was Young Valley who called for the game first, and soon all the gods were clamoring and shouting for a game. Valley stood up and announced the rules. All right, all right, settle down, friends. Here's the game I have in mind, he said, standing on his throne. I will draw a line and shoot an arrow across the hall, and then we will all stand behind it and take turns casting a spear at it. Each of us will have three attempts, and whoever comes the closest wins. Njord turned away from his lovely wife, dressed as finely as a snow-covered field, and spoke to Valley. Odin will have to sit out, for obvious reasons, he said. The reasons weren't quite as obvious to Nick, but he didn't interrupt. Either that, or he should leave his spear out of the game. All the gods agreed, and Odin sat back in his throne, agreeing to only watch the game. Loki, too, decided to sit out. He said he was bored by the ordeal and decided to watch, rather than participate. So the two elder gods sat out, and the rest of the gods began. Valley drew the line on the floor and shot an arrow across the hall. It buried itself in a pillar and stood as a target for all the contestants. Each god took his turn. Ullr first, then Thor, then Vali, then Heimdall, until all the gods and several of the goddesses had taken a turn. Even Hodor took his turn, though Valley had to guide him to the spot and direct his aim. Finally, it came to Nick. He grew nervous in front of all the gods. Some of their throws had gone wide, but most were close to the arrow. Some were only a couple yards away. Nick was no good at throwing spears, and he knew he would only embarrass himself in front of the gods, but they were already staring at him and urging him to throw. Carefully, Nick grasped the spear and lifted it. It was lighter than he expected, and it was perfectly balanced, but it still felt awkward in his untrained hand. He stepped up to the line and threw the spear, but it fell far short of its target. The gods laughed and made jokes, and he found his way to the back of the line, trying to hide his shame. Even Odin smiled slightly. Loki was the only one who didn't seem amused but Nick noticed that he became much more interested. He watched the game with attentive eyes. The gods took their turn again, and each one threw their spear at the arrow. This time, several of the gods came much closer. Forseti managed to strike the same pillar as the arrow, though it was still several feet away. It came time for Nick to throw his spear, and he sighed, but he took it up again and stepped up to the line. His second throw was even worse than the first one, falling short and going wide. The gods began to laugh and joke more about Nick's poor aim. Some of the servants laughed too, and even Odin began to chuckle. Again, Loki was silent, but a smile began to work its way across his face. Nick thought that Loki was laughing at him too, but as he looked closer, he realized that Loki wasn't paying attention to him. He was looking at the other gods. Nick shamefully worked his way to the back of the line. Each god took his third throw at the arrow. This time, Heimdall's spear landed a foot away from the arrow, and the gods cheered. Each remaining god took his turn, but they knew that Heimdall had won the contest. Nick looked around in utter humiliation. Even Hodor the Blind God had thrown better than him. His throw was nothing more than a formality, and he wanted to sit down and forget the contest had ever happened. But as he moved to the throwing line, he heard a voice in his head. Wanderer, son of Wanderer, make a showing of your next throw, the voice said. Brag about your ability, and ask each god for a prize if you win. Now I know I've lost my mind, Nick thought, but out of the corner of his eye he saw Loki smile. Make a showing and ask for prizes, the voice said. Only offer the best to me as a gift. Nick debated with himself whether or not to trust the voice in his head. It sounded like he was being set up for another joke. Something in his gut told him that he could trust the voice, though, and so he addressed the gods. You are all terrible throwers, he said, turning to face the Aesir. Heimdall at least came somewhat close, but even he couldn't hit the arrow. The gods began to grumble and stir, and Loki smirked silently in the background. Nick continued. We care only about the best throw, right? Well, watch this last one of mine, and I'll show you how you're supposed to cast a spear. The Aesir grew indignant at his claim and began mocking him even more, pointing out how even Hodor had outthrown him. Nick stood tall and did his best to regain their attention. If I miss, then all of you know what a bragger I am. But if I succeed, it seems only fair that I get a prize for it, Nick said. The Aesir still complained, but they agreed with what he said. Well, what will you give me if I win? I'll take three of my choosing. The gods laughed and began promising him outrageous gifts if he won. Freya promised she would kiss him, 
Heimdall promised his sword, and Thor promised a great drinking horn that never ran out of mead. All the Aesir began making wild promises until even the least of the gods had promised him an amazing gift. Nick accepted their offers and turned back to the throwing line. He felt even more nervous than ever, and before he got ready to throw, he heard the voice in his head again. Close your eyes when you throw, the voice said. I will guide the spear. Nick felt a jolt of fear run through him, but he took a deep breath and trusted the voice. He stepped up to the throwing line and turned around. He took a deep breath as he closed his eyes, then spun around and ran towards the throwing line, releasing the spear right before he crossed the line. The spear sailed through the air gracefully. It brushed the fletching of the arrow and buried itself an inch below the target. The god stood in bewildered amazement. Finally, the Aesir recovered and began cheering for Nick. They began offering him the best of gifts for his prize. Nick surveyed them and chose his three favorites. First, he selected a sword with magic runes. The sword would never dull and never break. It was sheathed in fine leather and the hilt was inlaid with gold and ivory. Next, he chose Frigga's falcon dress that allowed him to turn into a falcon. She had promised to let him use it once and he knew it would be a fine choice. Finally, he chose a great chest of treasure from Rand's net. He wanted a draught of the Kvasir mead, but even in his careless state, Bragi had not offered such a fine treasure. Nick claimed his prizes, and made an audacious showing as he walked towards Loki. He presented the god with Frigga's falcon dress, and Loki began laughing hysterically. All the gods grew red with embarrassment and anger, and they might have killed Nick. But before anyone did anything, Odin too began to laugh. It was quiet at first, but it grew to a loud, thunderous laugh, and soon all of the Aesir joined in, taking the joke with grace. Loki claimed his prize, and they all took their seat again. As Nick sat next to Baldur, Odin turned to him, Wanderer, son of Wanderer, Odin said, addressing Nick. Tell us how you came to these halls. Nick thought back on his journey, and a single tear came to his eye. Allfather, it is a sad story, Nick said. The night is late, and it might be best to leave it until tomorrow. We do not wish to bring you any grief, Odin said. But there are still many long hours of the night, and we would all like to hear your story. Nick sat back in his seat. He knew there was no getting out of it, so he relented. Very well, Allfather, he said. I will tell you how the story began. 